And now we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, welcome to the fourth session in our Bertelsmann Transformation Series, organized in partnership with our cousins at the Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. I'm Tony Silberfeld, Director of Transatlantic Relations at the Bertelsmann Foundation in Washington. I'll be the moderator for today's session titled The Struggle for Democracy in Asia, Regression, Resilience, Revival. The driving force behind this series is the Bertelsmann Transformation Index, which has examined the changing political and economic dynamics in 22 Asian countries, home to more than 4 billion people. We have a huge amount of ground to cover in the next hour, so I'm delighted to introduce the experts who will guide us along the way. To kick off the conversation with a closer look at the BTI results in Asia, we have Dr. Aurel Croissant, Professor of Political Science and Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences at Heidelberg University in Germany. He is also the BTI's Regional Coordinator for Asia and Oceania. Then we'll hear from Dr. Sharu Shirley Lin, Compton Visiting Professor in World Politics at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. She is also a faculty member at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Previously, she was a partner at Goldman Sachs, where she managed private equity investments in 12 countries. Her research is focused on the challenges facing high-income societies in East Asia. Rounding out today's panel will be Dr. Maiko Ichihara, Associate Professor in the Graduate School of Law at Hititsubashi University in Japan and a visiting scholar at the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law at Stanford University. She is also the co-chair of the Democracy for the Future Project at the Japan Center for International Exchange. Welcome to all of you. We're really honored to have you here and look forward to your remarks. Once we've heard from our speakers, we want to bring you all into the conversation as well. So at any point, please feel free to submit a question to the panelists using the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as time will allow. With that, I wanna thank you again for being here, and I'll now turn the floor over to Aurel for his presentation. Aurel, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Tony, and thanks to everyone, especially the organizers of this event, for inviting me to this conversation. I would like to start my remarks by saying that the global contestation between democracy and autocracy in the 21st century will be decided in Asia and Oceania. The region is both home to two of the three largest democracies in the world, Indonesia and India, and to the world's most powerful autocracy, which is of course China. As the BTI 2020 demonstrates, democracy in Asia is not immune against the temptations of autocratization and populist threats to democracy. Yet, I think it sends contradictory messages in the debate about a global decline or democratic recession. The region provides both major examples of democratic regression and failure, as well as inspiring stories of democratic resilience and revival. At a first glance at the BTI 2020 data, this does not indicate a wave of autocratization in the region. The region's average democracy score is almost the same in the BTI 2020 as it was in the BTI 2012. And this is a notable difference compared, for example, with Latin America and Eastern Europe, which are home to very widespread trends of democratic backsliding. At the same time, there's a considerable diversity in the levels of democracy in the region. Over the past 10 years, democratic backsliding in countries such as Indonesia, the Philippines, and most alarmingly, given its importance as the world's largest democracy, India, but also in countries like Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Thailand, contrast with fragile democratic gains in countries such as Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nepal, and Malaysia. In fact, the stability of the level of democracy in the region that this graph here is suggesting is a result of sometimes drastic changes in individual countries which balance each other out in the regional aggregate. As this graph shows, there are four broad trends in the development of democracy in the region. Please note that in the scatter plot, countries located below the diagonal registered a loss in democratic quality from the BTI 2012 
to the BDI 2020, whereas countries above the line registered more or less significant improvements. A first trend is what I would call democratic resilience. This can be observed in Taiwan and South Korea, as well as Japan and Timor-Leste, not shown in this graph. While Taiwan is often celebrated as a resounding success story of democratization, South Korea has just recently emerged from an extended period of democratic backsliding under conservative administration. The second trend is one of autocratic consolidation, most importantly, of course, in China, but also in Vietnam, Laos, and North Korea. The third trend is one of democratic regression, including countries such as Bangladesh, Cambodia, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, and India. Fragile democratic revival in countries such as Myanmar, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia constitute the fourth regional trend. So I think the first main point I want to raise is that there is no universal trend uh, towards democratic backsliding or uh, democratization in the region, but actually there are a number of sub-trends within the region. Combined, these four sub-trends result in the formation of three regime clusters. Consolidated or consolidating democracies, South Korea and Taiwan, of course also Japan, which is not included in the BDI, hard autocracies, and a third broad cluster of hybrid regimes in the gray zone of moderate autocracy and defective or highly defective democracy. Democratic regressions in Asia, as elsewhere, take various forms and proceed in different modes. As in other areas of the world, it is often the nominally democratic incumbents who use their government power to reward political friends while punishing critics, to curtail independent news media, civil and political liberties, and to degrade constitutional checks on executive power and the rule of law. As the examples of Prime Minister Modi in India and President Duterte in the Philippines demonstrate, each step taken might actually conform to the letter of the law. Its effect is not visible immediately and hence it might be difficult to identify ex post a tipping point when democracy is replaced by elective dictatorship. Similar to other regions, democratic regression or backsliding mainly affects four key indicators of democracy based on the rule of law. First, the fairness and freedom of elections, which is increasingly subject to polarization and manipulation. Second, restrictions imposed upon freedom of association and assembly. Third, freedom of expression, which is undermined through intimidation of journalists and the free press. And fourth, the weakening of separation of powers, judicial independence, and legislative constraints on executive authority through techniques of so-called executive aggrandizement. Somewhat counterintuitively, the aggregate score of civil rights in the Asian region suggests an improvement. However, this is mainly the result of significant improvements, though from low initial levels, in a number of countries which experienced fragile political liberalization and or democratic revivals, such as Malaysia and Myanmar in recent years. Generally, democracy in Asia is threatened by internal and external factors. Internally, the assault on political freedom and democratic norms is related to social polarization and the mobilization of diverse cultural and political identities, which feed on local consequences of global trends, such as technological change and globalization and rising levels of economic inequality. Praetorian legacies, horizontal inequalities between ethnic, religious, or regional groups that coincide with identity-based cleavages and low levels of social cohesion, although weaken democratic resilience in many places. The generally low support for liberal democratic values in most Asian democracies and a serious deficit of popular trust in fundamental institutions that underpin a democratic system also raise questions about the sustainability of democratic change in Asia. A deinstitutionizing role of political leaders strategic opportunism and the failure of political institutions to keep pace with growing demands also contribute 
to the rise of illiberal leaders in countries such as the Philippines, Pakistan, India, and Indonesia. Externally, mainland China has become a major source of ideational and material support for autocracies in Asia and beyond, such as Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand, as well as illiberal elected leaders in Sri Lanka or the Philippines. Even in Indonesia, one of the softer cases of democratic decline in Asia, government officials openly praise China's authoritarian governance model. Although not a direct cause of democratic decline, the growing influence of mainland China throughout the Asia Pacific region is increasingly affecting the domestic politics of both democratic and authoritarian countries throughout the region. China's new role as a regional power that provides alternative sources of support for autocratic or authoritarian minded governments contrasts with what I would call the collapse of US soft power in the region and elsewhere, and a loss of Western leverage in democracy promotion. At the same time, transnational cooperation among pro democratic actors from within the region remains weak and democracies such as South Korea or Japan are still hesitant to fill the void left by Western democracy promoters. So I guess Michael will talk more about this aspect. Yet the BTI data and country reports in the BDI 2020 also offer important insights into the factors and mechanisms that contained democratic decay in Asia. Scholars of democratization and autocratization discuss three accountability mechanisms as potential remedies of democratic regression. First, horizontal accountability. Second, vertical accountability. And third, diagonal accountability. Democratic resilience then is the possible outcome of the interaction of all three different mechanisms of accountability. In the Asia Pacific region, and maybe also in other regions, Mechanisms of horizontal accountability, that is what the data from the BDI 2020 and previous reports suggest, seem to be least effective. Contrary to what democracy grafters and institution builders in Asia had hoped for when writing constitutions or organic laws, these institutions are often not able to rescue democracy. Often they are the first to fall. Mechanisms of vertical accountability, especially transparent and clean elections, offer options of democratic resistance that seem more promising, especially if defection of elites from within the political camp aligned with a potential autocrat weakens the incumbent around election time. Sri Lanka is a case uh, or an example for that. However, elections alone are often not effective tools to stop autocratizers because the later often enjoy considerable popular support. Duterte is incredibly popular among Filipinos. Or voters may already have lost the ability to remove the incumbent by democratic means because the incumbent hasn't manipulated the electoral game. This leaves mechanisms of diagonal accountability as the most effective accountability mechanism. Examples for the political power of ordinary citizens in Taiwan and South Korea, and I would also add Hong Kong, suggest that civic resistance mobilized by civil society and opposition parties is the last and maybe only line of defense against democratic regression. But reliance on mechanism of civic resistance also involves political risks. In the short term, wannabe autocrats may react with counter mobilization contributing to further polarization and conflict escalation. Furthermore, for diagonal accountability to be a mechanism of democratic resilience, resistance, and revival, a sufficient number of citizens must prefer a democratic form of government and have some degree of trust in democratic institutions. However, in many Asian societies, it seems that popular support for democracy and trust in democracy's core institutions is weak and has been eroding somewhat in recent years. Clearly the COVID-19 pandemic must be mentioned as well. As the BTI data show, the pandemic cannot be the cause for democratic backsliding in Asia because democratic backsliding and regression began in some countries, many countries before 
the outbreak of the pandemic. Yet there is considerable concern among observers that the ongoing pandemic might weaken democracy further. However, I would argue based on the BTI data, for example, that the impact of the pandemic on democracy will differ between countries according to the health of their democratic institutions and norms. Democracies weakened by pre-existing conditions are certainly at greater risk compared to healthy democracies. Importantly also, the Asian experiences demonstrate that both autocracies, Vietnam, Thailand, and Singapore, and democracies, Taiwan and South Korea, can succeed in mitigating the short-term impact of the pandemic on their societies. Autocracies may be able to act as effectively or more effectively than democracies, but I would argue at higher enforcement costs. Democracies can act as effectively at lower costs as autocracies, provided they have the political will to do so. A quick glance at Asia and of course Europe and North America would suggest that populist governments are probably the worst of both worlds. Populist governance weakens democracy and produces poor public health. Keeping democratic institutions healthy is therefore, I would argue, a key ingredient for preserving public health and democracies in Asia and Oceania and elsewhere. And with this, I'd like to close. Thanks for your attention. Aurel, thank you very much for that presentation. Really interesting and clearly a mixed bag in a very diverse region. Um, you know, one, one particular issue that looms large over all of this is the influence of China. Um, and whether we're talking about in a single country across the region or indeed around the world. And with that, I wanna to turn to Shirley for her comments and observations when it comes to China and, uh, and how, it, how China impacts uh, the Asian region. Shirley, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, discussion. I want to highlight what Aurel mentioned in his presentation in regards to Asia being at the forefront of the global competition between democracy and authoritarianism. The competition, of course, is led by China, which demonstrates by example that an authoritarian regime can be efficient, productive, and actually highly stable. This creates counter pressure on all democracies in Asia, but much more so for Taiwan and Hong Kong. Taiwan is the most resilient democracy in Asia and Hong Kong potentially a democracy, but one whose emergence is being restricted by Beijing. For Beijing, of course, the existence of a democratic and pluralistic Taiwan and a city like Hong Kong with increasing demand for democracy is a direct contradiction of Beijing's propaganda that democracy is not suitable to Chinese people or Chinese culture. Although Beijing does not actively promote a Chinese model of governance. It desperately wants to show the world by example that its governance system can benefit Hong Kong and be suitable for unifying Taiwan. Although Beijing claims to have the rights to govern both Hong Kong and Taiwan, signs of unrest in Hong Kong and resistance unification in Taiwan would diminish Beijing's claim that all Chinese people would prefer its so-called meritocratic authoritarianism as opposed to Western liberal democracy. Now in the last decade, Taiwan has experienced several elections which repeatedly transfer power peacefully between the two major parties. From 2008 to 16, the Kuomintang, which favors accommodating China, controlled both the executive and the legislative branches. But in 2014, Taiwanese people, especially young people, changed their mind and thought that over-relying on China economically would eventually dilute Taiwan's democracy. In the 2014 local elections and 2016 national elections, the DPP, which favored diversifying economic risks away from China, when in most cities, and then later the presidency, as well as a control over the legislature. And then in 2018, surprising again, Taiwanese changed their mind and gave the Kuomintang 15 out of 22 mayorship, including a new star, Mayor Han Guoyu, who became the head of Kaohsiung, a city which had not voted for the KMT for over 20 years. His platform was simple. Let's integrate more with China and not rule out unification. 
for the sake of uh, appeasement. But mass protests in Hong Kong in 2019, a more assertive Beijing, and a better than expected economy led directly to a landslide for the Democratic Progressive Party in the 2020 election, with a record over 8 million votes for the current president, Tsai Ing-wen. But even more dramatically, just two months ago, the very popular KMT mayor of Kaohsiung was recalled after only two years on the job. So in terms of election mechanism, Taiwan has a robust system with results voters and international observers accept and participate in. During the 2018 and to a lesser extent, the 2020 national election, Beijing actively spread misinformation through social media and traditional media outlets in order to directly influence the results. Civil society was very important in resisting such intervention, especially groups organized by young people to look into misinformation and fake news. I think this is one of the most important aspects of Taiwanese democracy, which is social engagement on keeping the elections fair and free. Xi Jinping also doubled down on the carrot and stick strategy and cut off tourists to Taiwan before the elections. But also, Beijing gave out benefits and incentives to professionals and businesses alike. The strategy has largely failed in the past decade, as well as the decades before it. However, it may eventually bear fruit if Taiwanese find unification under authoritarian Beijing inevitable, if not desirable. Lastly, COVID-19. It's given Taiwan an opportunity to show the world how a democracy can be resilient in fighting a pandemic. With 23 million people, there have only been seven deaths and fewer than 500 cases. There are many reasons why Taiwan has succeeded, but much of it has to do, I believe, with being a democracy. There is trust at all levels between the government and the people and among citizens themselves. Furthermore, fully utilizing technology to be transparent and communicative, as opposed to using technology to control or spy on its citizens, was one of the key factors for the government's success in implementing healthcare policy. China, on the other hand, has not only not helped with the pandemic, it has tried to exercise control over the World Health Organization and other organizations to marginalize Taiwan. Let's turn to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is very vulnerable as a society. And despite political will by the people to move towards democracy, although up to 2 million people protested the, extra, the anti-extradition law in June 2019, most of them also were eager for universal suffrage, but the government has proven to be largely unresponsive and unaccountable. During the pandemic, Beijing continued the suppression of democratic demands. It imposed a national security law on Hong Kong just this July, which criminalizes anyone supporting independence, engaging in protest uh, that it classifies as riots, and anyone involved in seditious activities which can simply mean the disruption of government activities. This also led to the disqualification of many pro-democracy candidates for the upcoming September Legislative Council election. The government, government then postponed the election for one year, citing public health concerns. Most people suspect that Beijing just wants to avoid the embarrassment of last November, when pro-democracy candidates won overwhelmingly in a by-election. This postponement may result in an even more embarrassing result for Beijing. However, the central and local government have many ways to make it nearly impossible for pro-democracy candidates to run next year. Furthermore, the pandemic and the contracting economy may contribute to more people, many people giving up on fighting for universal suffrage. Hong Kong's recent inability to fight off another wave of the pandemic also demonstrates a government that successfully dealt with the pandemic in its early stage, but still failed to cope with successive waves of the virus, especially cases imported from abroad by returning residents, many who were exempt from testing. My current research is on the high income trap that Taiwan and Hong Kong face, featuring slower growth, demographic decline, and a revolution of declining expectations, if you will, among younger people. This trap is a challenge for East Asian democracies, including Japan, South Korea, and Singapore alike. While people in these democracies, especially the younger generation, 
want to preserve their way of life and defend values such as freedom of speech and assembly. The prospect of contracting economies, youth unemployment, and wage stagnation will all make engaging with China more attractive and inevitable in the long term. Thank you. Shirley, thanks very much for those comments. Uh, I want to turn now to Maiko, who's going to take a look at, uh, at democratic support systems across the region. Maiko, over to you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so given these uh, two speakers' um, presentations on uh, the challenges um, that, uh, that democracy has been facing, um, I would like to um, shed light on the democracy support side um, within the East Asian region, um, spanning from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia. Despite uh, the democratic regression, which has been um, occurring um, since especially um, mid-2000s, um, the actions and discourse for the support of democracy has been actually uh, in increase in the region, both amongst um, governmental actors and um, civil society actors, although um, the um, actions are much weaker compared to Europe and the United States. And there are some reasons, uh, mainly two reasons, why um, such democracy support activities has been um, taking place. One is apparently um, due to the increased number of democratic countries in the region. And um, secondly, um, the concern about the weakening, weakening um, aspect of the liberal internationalism has been um, sh widely shared within the, uh, the region. Um, with the rise of China, especially um, with Xi Jinping's um, arrival, um, and also uh, Trump administration's um, policies under the uh, well, in the United States, and also the growing populism and um, further um, worsening recession of democracy um, has been increasing the necessity um, to support democracy abroad. Amongst governmental um, members, um, there have been uh, multiple um, actions um, for uh, democracy support. Um, although um, it uh, sort of um, reflects the diversity of political regimes um, within the region. And um, because of this um, diversity of political regimes, um, the, the governments have to um, pay attention not to be concerned, uh, considered that they are um, interfering in, into domestic affairs of other countries. For example, um, Bali Democracy Forum was um, launched by the Indonesian government in 2008, and uh, it has been um, gathering top leadership from ministries of foreign, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, within the Asia-Pacific region annually, um, to share success stories and information about democratic um, consolidation and democratization. Um, however, um, this um, forum um, is difficult to be used for um, the discussion of very um, serious sort of um, issues because um, Bali Democracy Forum um, um, does not um, allow um, participants to finger point and um, it uh, or gets hesitated um, to compare amongst the countries. And also there's, uh, well, so far at least, no interaction between pillars of um, government and civil society. Um, another um, example um, of governmental um, action toward um, democracy um, support is free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which was launched in 2017. Uh, it, it was centered around the quadrilateral um, cooperation amongst um, Japan, the United States, um, Australia, and India. And the way it, uh, uh, it, um, it pays attention not to be concerned, uh, considered that um, it's um, interfering into domestic affairs is um, can, is by not emphasizing democracy too much. Um, this is especially um, the case of Japan, um, which is the um, origin of this um, free, free and open Indo-Pacific vision. But um, Japan um, does not use the term democracy um, as an overarching um, vision 
that, uh, that um, this free and open Indo-Pacific vision is trying to achieve, but instead um, it uses um, those terms like um, transparency, accountability, and the rule of law as the sort of govern governance norms that um, it intends to share amongst the regional countries. And um, governmental bilateral support has been um, expanding as well, especially um, in terms of technical assistance and the creation of democratic narratives. Um, and um, this has been especially the case since two, uh, mid 2000s, um, when, um, for example, Japan um, launched the Arc of Freedom and Prosperity Initiative um, to start um, sharing um, narratives on um, democracy and uh, expanding support um, with um, foreign aid um, for the rule of law and capacity building of um, state institutions. Indonesia has been playing an important role in um, bringing um, many proposals to ASEAN um, pertaining to um, democracy and human rights, which include the uh, proposal to establish ASEAN Security Community in 2003 and um, the inclusion of um, democracy and human rights in the preamble of the ASEAN Charter in 2007. India has been um, supporting election assistance for, um, for some time um, and um, Korea's um, COICA has been providing um, good and democratic governance assistance and um, Taiwan is also um, playing a very uh, interesting role um, in the region um, by providing for, uh, foreign aid um, for um, well, many countries. And one of the um, interesting um, frameworks is Global Cooperation and Training Framework, um, which started in 2015 between um, Taiwan and the United States. And um, in 2019, Japan joined this uh, global cooperation and training framework. This um, framework um, helps um, Taiwan to share um, their experiences of um, law enforcement, women's empowerment, good governance, those governance slash democracy related um, experiences with third countries. And um, these actions and narratives um, for the support of democracy has been expanding amongst non-governmental um, actors as well. Um, and this is especially since um, 2010s. And uh, they, uh, there have been um, multiple um, frameworks and networks launched and they have been creating narratives for democracy support. They have been sharing information and also um, conducting trainings for um, young um, activists. Examples include um, Asia Democracy Network, which is a network of um, human rights and democracy activists. Um, Asia Democracy Research Network, which is a network amongst think tanks um, to promote um, research on democracy. Uh, currently, this um, Asia Democracy Research Network is conducting um, um, research on disinformation's impact on to democracy. And um, ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights um, was established as a solidarity base amongst um, parliamentarians um, within Southeast Asia. And um, Taiwan also established um, East Asia Democracy Forum um, to share information about um, democratic defense. Um, and these, um, these forums were established in 2010s. And this year, um, there, there was a very uh, interesting new um, development, which was led by American think tanks, um, such as um, CSIS, together with uh, National Endowment for Democracy and Annenberg Foundation Trust for Sunny Lands, which is called um, Sunny Lands Principles. Um, this includes um, Asian actors um, such as Japan, South Korea, India, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And they are uh, well, in the process of um, creating um, uh, greater narratives for democracy. Um, and um, they um, published um, uh, what, what they call Sunny Land Principles uh, just last month, which include um, action plans um, for the democratic defense.
So um, overall, as a conclusion, um, in the past 10 years, um, there has been um, expanded um, actions and support and narratives um, for the support of democracy um, amongst both governmental actors and non-governmental actors, which came um, due to the needs for doing so. And also some governments um, will try, uh, have been trying to do so as a counter influence um, against China. Um, but uh, recent um, expansion of um, authoritarian leaders, um, as Aurel and um, Shirley were talking about, together with the um, expanded um, repression of freedom and civil society under the COVID um, pandemic, requires us to upgrade support for democracy within the region. Uh, thank you very much. Maiko, thanks very much. Uh, we have some questions that have been trickling in. I just want to remind the audience to make use of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to do a round of questions here to give you an opportunity to, to punch in some questions for us, and we'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, Aurel, I wanted to start with you. Uh, you mentioned in your slides, and, and all of our speakers actually have touched a bit on, on the COVID-19 crisis. And given, the, given your work over the last couple of years on this particular report, I wonder if there's anything that's really jumped out at you as being distinctly different now in a post-COVID or in the midst of COVID. Um, are there any countries that would, that would uh, score differently? Uh, any issues that might emerge in certain countries that didn't emerge before COVID? Well, thanks, Tony. Uh, well, I would say uh, COVID is something like a accelerator of previous trends. So the gap between those countries, democratic or not so democratic, like Singapore, for example, um, that or, or, or Vietnam, uh, which is, of course, a very hot uh, authoritarian regime, those countries that provided good governance, fairly good governance in the pre-COVID period because they had sufficient stateness or state capacity plus political will to act on, on important social problems. Uh, those countries performed fairly or relatively well during the COVID uh, pandemic so far. While countries that have seen a regression of governance performance or the quality of governance in recent years, democratic and autocratic countries, autocratic countries like Pakistan uh, or Cambodia, democratic countries like India and Indonesia. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated this trend. So I would say it's, it's not uh, a, a critical juncture, which then leads to totally different paths of political uh, development or governance trends, but it's more like an accelerator or, or an, an, um, a, a push factor that reinforces previous trends. Um, and it once again shows uh, that in Asia, uh, as Shirley mentioned, and also Maiko made a point, in Asia it's not that authoritarian governments per se provide bad governance and democratic governments per se provide good governance, but there's a huge variety of variation in governance uh, performance between democracies and, and, and among uh, authoritarian regimes. Thanks, Aurel. Mike, I want to just pick up on, on some of those points there uh, and turn to you. I mean, in this, in this latest version of the BTI results, I think it was mentioned that about half of the 22 countries are functioning democracies. And you spoke a lot about democracy support across the region and strides that have been made, and that's certainly laudable. Um, but I wonder if there's something unique about Asia that certain obstacles that might emerge that makes it difficult for it to be 21 or 22 out of 22 rather than just half. Uh, of the countries in the region being democratic. Okay, uh, I think one of the um, interesting things about um, Asia, um, especially um, compared to um, Europe or um, Latin America is um, the diversity of um, regime types within the um, Asian region. Um, so when um, democratic countries or um, democratic actors um, try to um, promote democracy within the region, um, they have to pay attention not to um, um, make those frameworks um, to um, apparently exclude those undemocratic um, countries or actors. Well, um, you know, the, the purpose is that they want to um, convince those um, authoritarian um, countries or actors that um, they should, um, you know, uh, well, they should democratize um, those um, 
um, and, and they, they should um, include those democratic norms um, within their governance. And so, um, and, well, in my, uh, in my presentation, I said that, uh, you know, um, those um, democratic countries within the region will, uh, will intentionally avoid um, using the term democracy. And um, that, that's especially because, um, for, uh, for example, for um, the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, um, in order to um, in involve um, other Southeast Asian countries um, that are not um, democracies, um, and they, um, Japan and uh, those um, other countries are using um, a signal that we are not gonna force you to choose between us democracies or China so that you can comfortably um, sit together with us. Thanks, Michael. You know, I want to stay with you for a moment before I turn to Shirley. Someone from the audience uh, raised a question that I think connects very well to what you just mentioned and maybe expands on it further. And the question was whether democracy is a true end goal for Asian societies and uh, why is democracy viewed as something to fight for among younger generations? Okay, um, well, I have to um, point out that uh, um, the uh, motivations for democracy support um, can, well, um, are slightly different amongst um, you know, governmental actors and non-governmental actors. For non-governmental actors, um, it started as um, you know, necessity for those um, pro-democracy um, actors that are um, at risk. You know, they, they needed to come together to um, create um, solidarity base um, well, to share information um, and uh, support each other. But um, when it comes to governmental actors, um, for example, um, for Japan, um, the original incentive came um, from more like power-based um, perspective. Um, Japan is a declining power within the region. It needed to um, seek um, other, well, a new way to um, well, maintain its influence. And so that's how it brought in this um, democracy discourse. And um, similar thing can be said about um, Indonesia, which um, well, started emphasizing uh, well, uh, democracy and human rights under the Suslo Bamba Yudhoyono uh, administration. Apparently, um, he was an internationalist. And so he was, um, um, he, well, it was natural for him to use uh, diplomacy but um, especially um, as in Indonesia, which was rising as a middle, uh, middle income country and a new member um, to um, G20, I mean, well, became a member of G20, um, it needed to um, sort of, um, you know, seek a well, um, tool with which to um, well, increase its influence uh, on the international um, forum. And so that's how democracy was um, you know, focused on. Thanks, Maiko. Shirley, Tony, I wonder, yeah, I, go ahead, Shirley, can I of course. add to what uh, Maiko was saying about the younger generation Please. and whether democracy is the true and end goal. And maybe in that effort, I could um, also answer the three questions that were directed to me uh, that I see, because I think it's uh, part and parcel of the same question. Um, I think the younger generation um, see things a little bit differently. Uh, than the older generation in what we call sort of greater China, in the, the Chinese culture realm, if you will. I think that the, um, the word democracy means different things to different people. And um, democracy is also the quest of many young people in mainland China. But when they say democracy, a lot of Chinese um, uh, culture, would you say, um, uh, people influenced uh, by Chinese culture would think about democracy as in result not process. And I think this is something that's quite important to appreciate democracy is a process and therefore it is very, very vulnerable. One of the questions raised to me was, uh, do you think Taiwan is actually that resilient? And I have to say, I didn't say Taiwan was resilient. I was just saying the BTI actually index shows Taiwan as being quite high up there, um, but actually it is under the greatest threat of all the countries because of course, um, for example, next week, a high level US official is coming to Taipei and that will immediately put uh, the Taiwan Strait in play if you will. So I think the issue of China as the most important external factor uh, makes this quite complicated. But for the younger generation, 
um, they simply uh, re remembering the Hong Kong younger generation grew up under the Chinese uh, rule, actually. It was after 1997 that many of them were born who are joining the protests. And in Taiwan, the younger generation, basically those in surveys under 29, have never lived in a non-democracy. So the memory is quite different. But for the older generation, many people appreciate efficiency and having an economic prospect that is brighter than they could ever remember. And these things are actually quite attractive. So when you talk about democracy as the end goal, I don't believe that that's what actually most people think about as the word uh, and some, some uh, imaginary concept. Um, but for the younger people, it does mean being able to use technology freely uh, to basically do what you like, wake up every morning and go where you like to go and take the job you like. And this is uh, described in many of my uh, field study as uh, really a way of life, simply uh, not imagining having any constraint over your political, social, or economic future. Uh, and so I think that uh, the younger generation really um, sees it uh, quite differently than older people who also want democracy. and. Um, uh, one of the other questions that's really relevant is, uh, given how important China is as an external factor, what are the ways um, that whether Hong Kong and Taiwan can actually fight um, uh, that pressure off and pursue the kind of life they want? And I think one of the, the, the key things that I, I was trying to talk about is um, both in terms of sharp power that China exudes uh, exerts, it's very important to have um, civil society and people organize on the ground, bottom up, because democracy uh, has to involve really uh, the society at large. Thanks, Shirley. I want to stay with you on a couple of questions because there seems to be, certainly in the Q&A, a lot of interest in the situation in Hong Kong. Um, I want to start maybe by taking a step back at the broader global view as it pertains to Hong Kong. And I wonder if you can make an assessment uh, of the U.S. and European response to the latest developments in Hong Kong? Um, well, first of all, to speak about it uh, may actually be illegal. I'm actually in Hong Kong. Um, so you can imagine the, uh, the pressure is immense. Um, anything you do could be uh, basically most of Michael's uh, discussions about um, working together as democracies. Most of those organizations uh, for any of us to work with them would be deemed to be um, a criminal act. Uh, so you can imagine the pressure here is great. I think that as of now, August 6th today, it's hard to see where the red line is. Uh, it's not clear if I'm able to speak on this you know, panel and say what I want to say, uh, where does one draw the line? Um, but I think that the US and the European countries offering, for example, um, status for Hong Kong people to migrate. Uh, these are things that have happened in the past in terms of migration. Uh, but I think um, the, uh, the key issue, as, as Maiko says, uh, can democracies work together and can transnational organizations, uh, you know, really um, lend force. And I think in this way, um, uh, there, there are important messages because Hong Kong is an international financial center and uh, being involved um, with, uh, uh, in terms of currency, in terms of trade and investment, what the, what the rest of the world is very important for China, uh, most importantly, and for Hong Kong. So I think those kinds of pressure are very important. But at the same time, I think in terms of uh, getting organized uh, from the ground up, from the bottom up, uh, I think there needs to be a lot more work um, uh, inside Hong Kong. Uh, to make this uh, something that is viable uh, going forward. And I'm afraid that um, the COVID-19 situation makes um, uh, uh, organizing um, and uh, getting together uh, and putting out a narrative increasingly difficult. And that is not something that uh, outside forces can actually help with. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and Aurel and Maiko, let me start with you, Aurel, just to pick up on that point. I mean, the, the absence of, of U.S. leadership and credibility on democracy promotion clearly is an issue, whether it's, it's a big issue in Asia, it's up for you all to decide. Um, I wonder if you can also make sort of a judgment on what that absence has done in terms of your observations in, uh, in democratic trends in Asia. Oh, I mean, first of all, uh, the U.S. obviously is not the only country or uh, Washington is not the only government that uh, claims to be active in democracy promotion, but it is obviously the most important player uh, in that uh, game. 
um, though the the uh, first weakening and then uh, as I mentioned collapse of uh, American soft power and although the indifferent uh, position that uh, the Trump administration has taken towards uh, erosion of democracy in many countries in Asia including India and, and Cambodia for example it, it provides an opportunity for authoritarian strongmen or democratically elected strongmen to pursue their political strategy of uh, limiting freedoms, limiting civil uh, liberties and entrenching their uh, political power. And, and, but it's not, it, it, it's not only, uh, uh, I, I think bashing Washington and the Trump administration is only one side of the equation. The other part is of course that the European Union is also struggling with how to respond to democratic backsliding in Asia and of course democratic backsliding among member countries uh, of the European Union in, in Eastern Europe. And of course there's this chronic or uh, notoric lack of coordination between European countries when it comes to democracy promotion, especially in a region like Asia. So uh, the weakening leverage of Western democratic governments in Asia obviously on the one hand may strengthen China's uh, strategy or aim to establish uh, mainland China as the dominant political actor in the region, but especially it allows semi-authoritarian, permits semi-authoritarian or authoritarian governments to continue with their strategy of eroding democracy in the region. That, that, I think that's a huge problem. And then of course, uh, what, what, what Charlie mentioned with the rather instrumental approach of uh, the US government towards Taiwan, uh, also not intentionally, but as an unintended consequence, may also increase uh, tensions in the region. Michael, would you like to add to that? Sure. Um, so, um, thank you. Um, so, um, well, American um, influence and this symbolic influence under especially Trump uh, administration has been having, uh, well, I would say both um, positive and negative um, impact um, when it comes to democracy support um, within the region. Um, starting from uh, the negative aspect, um, apparently the discourse um, well, on democracy has been uh, negatively um, um, impacted, um, especially together with uh, the influence of China's shock power. Um, China can utilize, uh, you know, the um, um, Trump administration's uh, policies that do not um, align um, well with uh, those democratic norms and uh, it can um, use um, those um, um, demonstrations uh, that um, that's taking place within the within the country and how um, you know um, for example um, police um, has been using uh, violence um, against black, uh, black lives matter um, demonstrations and so forth so um, uh, well, uh, so, so that's a negative part. But uh, well, I would say there are two positive um, things. Uh, one is um, that um, due to this um, symbolic loss of American um, in, uh, or, um, presence as a supporter, um, those regional countries has been um, upgrading their um, emphasis on democracy to sort of um, you know for those middle powers to. Um, um, play um, greater roles with uh, the superpower of the United States. And um, that's especially um, together with um, India, Australia, and Japan. And India's case, I think, uh, well, um, is um, well, interesting probably because um, Indi India has been um, very um, um, resistant about um, cooperating together with the United States um, well, due to the um, experience um, during the Cold War period. You know, during the Cold War, the U.S. did not um, emphasize um, India as a democratic country, and so there was no cooperation between the two countries. But um, all of a sudden, um, India is asked, asked to um, cooperate with um, the United States um, for democracy. So they're like, uh, you know, um, well, they, are, they, they see um, some um, skepticism um, about um, um, cooperation with the U.S. But uh, um, with the um, weakened um, role of the United States, um, there is a greater possibility that those regional countries can cooperate. Um, and uh, also, 
Although um, there's a symbolic weakening of American presence, but uh, well, the um, Trump administration has been actually also positively affecting um, American um, well, NGOs in Congress in a way that they um, work, um, uh, they upgrade um, their um, support work for uh, democracy. So actually uh, in 2019, um, U.S. budget for um, democracy support was greater compared to the past. So we'll be able to have to take, into, take that into account. Tony, Thanks, could I Mike. also add to, uh, to what, both, what both of them said about the most important elephant in the room, and it's not China, it's actually the United States, of course, because we're on the point of democracy. So I would want to, I, I like to add uh, to what they were saying with, um, uh, again, back to my example, what are the detractors of democracy uh, in Taiwan? What would they say about the current situation? With the COVID-19, with US-China competition, rivalry increasing in intensity, and uh, there's two things that are very important and telling also basically for Hong Kong. And that is with uh, the economy contracting, projected to contract four uh, or 5% uh, between Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, and on top of it with the COVID-19, what if China were to be the only lifeline for these economies? All of the democracies in Asia work with China very closely and increasingly so, and even under the Democratic Progressive Party uh, government. Actually, trade surplus with China became uh, reached an all-time high in 2018. So how do you make sense of that? And, and that is, of course, uh, that we're seeing a real problem with declining growth in the advanced economies in the world. And with the pandemic, if the democracies, uh, if the high-income economies, most of them are democracies, cannot fight the pandemic well and cannot provide an economic alternative to the democracies in Asia, they will have to side with China ever more than before and accept many uh, political accommodation. And the second thing, of course, that the detractors say uh, is the U.S. is completely unreliable, unpredictable, and so the, the usual strategy for the last few decades, basically, of hedging um, is not viable anymore hedging for uh, Asian democracies to work with the U.S. on security and work with China economically. How is that going to work continuing forward uh, if China were to be the first to develop the vaccine? And if China were to develop the vaccine first, would it give any to Taiwan? And how would it ask you know, Hong Kong to, um, to comply? Uh, what it re requires uh, politically of Hong Kong citizens. And so I think that, that that dilemma will continue for many more years to come. And I look forward to the BTI in another decade. Thanks, Shirley. You know, I love this format um, because we're able to, to get so much in in a very limited amount of time, but it is never enough time. Um, we've got about two minutes remaining, and there are several thematic areas, at least, in the questioning that I was hoping we could get to. And maybe what we'll do is, I'll, I'll raise some of those here, and in, in your final thoughts, maybe you could address some of them as best you can in you know, 30, 45 seconds each, which is <laughs> nearly impossible, but we'll give, our, give it our best shot. Uh, the one that keeps popping up over and over, is, and, and I think many of you have raised the issue around the specter for increased tension uh, and conflict emerging in the region and what that might look like. Um, Aurel, I'm gonna start with you. Um, can you talk a bit about what you think that will, how that will play out both in terms of democracy, uh, in relationships within the region, the role of China. It's a lot to cover, but maybe you can have some final thoughts on what would happen in, in the event of a conflict uh, breaking out in the region. Well, probably the most important election in Asia will be the one on November 3rd in Washington and in the US. So because I, th I think a lot will, uh, the answer to your question will may, to, to a very large extent depend on whether uh, the Trump administration will have a second term or if the Biden administration will come in. Um, tension in, the, uh, in Asia, I mean, the, I, I'm not looking forward to the BTI 10 years from now because I'm afraid that the data won't uh, make me happy as so someone who would like to see more cooperation among democracies, cooperation among democracies and autocracies and more democracy in Asia. So I'm afraid that at the moment we, we are at the beginning of an extended period of conflict, tension and maybe some destabilization, uh, political destabilization in Asia. So I'm not that optimistic with regard to the short and medium term 
perspectives of democracy and stability in the region. Maiko? Uh, okay, um, so um, my final thoughts um, is that, uh, well, in order to prepare for um, greater confrontation um, for, uh, between democracy and authoritarianism um, within the region, we have to try to expand the types of actors um, who can um, play some roles. And um, I think, um, well, there are three things probably necessary. One is um, to provide, uh, well, to, to, uh, one is to make sure that uh, civil society um, can continue functioning fine. So in order, uh, in order for that, I mean, we have to provide moral support and more material support for civil society by uh, launching statements or providing funding and so forth. Secondly, um, we have to expand the role of um, parliamentarians. Um, well, one good example was seen uh, actually in Japan in relation to Hong Kong of Japanese parliamentarians. Um, uh, well, um, stood up um, to um, show their moral support for um, um, for against uh, the national security law and for the support of Hong, Kong Hong Kongers, and um, that sort of uh, role is much more needed. And so, well, um, if um, Western uh, pro democracy actors could um, you know talk to those uh, parliamentarians in Asia overall um, to um, do. Um, to work differently from their government, um, and that will be um, a plus. And finally, um, we also have to find, um, find um, some funding mechanisms that can function um, to protect those um, democracy and democratic countries. Quasi-governmental functions and uh, funding mechanisms um, such as um, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy might uh, be a, a good example. And also we have to think about um, possible regional funding mechanisms for, for that sake as well. Thanks, Maiko. Shirley, the last word is yours. Thank you. Um, I think in the increasingly difficult international environment, what is really important is for democratic countries to govern themselves better, to give young people jobs, opportunities. So in the pending uh, war, and by war, I think that a military um, confrontation likelihood is always there it seems to be increasing, although I think that the overall likelihood may still be smaller than the biggest problems that we will be facing, and that is technology war. Uh, young people today that will have to find jobs in the next three to five years, uh, I don't know where that will be coming from, but to find opportunities so that they can keep on fighting, so that they can keep the dreams alive. Um, there needs to be an economic uh, outlook uh, that, uh, that will be able to guide them on what it means to be in a democracy that, has, uh, um, uh, that can reduce inequality, uh, that can actually bring a better future. And that gives meaning to the word democracy. And uh, moreover, uh, in terms of this decoupling of US and China, I just want to add, uh, perhaps um, I'm mistaken, but I think quite differently than Arel. I think that it doesn't matter who's the American president, the Congress, the American people, they're moving in a direction that will be the new normal and that we will have to learn how to cope and that democracies will have to learn to be more resilient on their own um, and uh, govern better. Shirley, thanks for that. It's a great place to end. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you very much to the panelists, to Shirley, Maiko, and Aurel. It's really a pleasure to talk to you, and I, I always learn a lot whenever I listen to you, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, to the audience, I just want to draw your attention to the chat box. If you're interested in reading the BTI results, I put the link in there. Feel free to copy it and make use of it. It's a great report, though a very sobering report. And I just want to thank you all for being here and spending your part, at least part of your day with us. And then lastly, I just wanted to make a housekeeping note that the next session of the BTI webinar series on Africa is on August 13th, a week from today at 10 a.m. So look out for the invitation for that. And I hope you all will join us then. So with that, I wish you all a good day. Be safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.